It's now time to move on to our investments in the healthcare sector. And we will be joined by uh, members of the team as well as some of the amazing founders that we partner with. But before, let's start with a clip uh, outlining what's going on in the healthcare sector. So we will now be joined by Chris Bischoff, Senior Investment Director, and Christian Scherer, Investment Manager, both working primarily within our healthcare sector. So Chris, it was recently announced that you will actually be leaving Shinovic to take up a position with General Catalyst. And that's, of course, a partner of ours in companies such as Livongo, Antelodoc, and Cityblock. But uh, you've been part of building our organization for eight years. So can you share with us what's been the most exciting for these past years? Yes, Torin, it's been an extraordinary transformation over these last eight years. And I think it's one that reflects the boldness and vision that are the hallmarks of Shinovic. If you look at Shinovic today, it's comparable to the company I joined uh, back in 2013. And I think that reflects the strategic shifts we very intentionally undertook across sector, geography, and investment stage. I'm particularly proud of our journey in healthcare, where we anticipated some of the key trends that are driving change and better care today, and carefully built a portfolio of five high-performing assets in five years. These assets are now valued over $3 billion, and pro forma for the proposed spin-off of Zalando will account for 40% of Shinovic's NAV. Whilst I will be leaving the firm, I believe this extraordinary portfolio will serve as a pillar of Shinovic for many years to come. And I look forward to partnering with Shinovic on new investments, and I will remain a very proud shareholder. Well, I'm certainly glad to hear that. So, Christian, you've been part of uh, sort of uh, establishing our strategy within healthcare, and you've also been part of uh, investing into some of our current portfolio winners. Could you share with the audience what's going on in the healthcare sector today that is driving our investment thesis? Yeah, sure, Torun. Healthcare is one of the largest and fastest growing cost drivers in the US economy. Every fifth dollar is spent on healthcare, and it's growing at twice the rate of GDP growth. So clearly, Torun, these trends are not sustainable, and they take bold action to be reverted. Christian, if you take a look at the US healthcare ecosystem, um, how do you think around the need to uh, lower costs, but at the same time drive more quality and better patient experience, particularly in a time like this where there's so much need? Yeah, Chris, uh, I think it's easy to dehumanize healthcare because of all the cost and complexity that's in the system. And so, Chris, you're right to focus on the patient first. One in three families in the U.S. actually did not seek medical care because of cost reasons. That's a shocking number. And so we see two levers 
that will improve patient experience and at the same time reduce cost. The first is digital care delivery. Last year, virtual care went from an adjacency use case to really to the norm. And Chris, you see this in, for example, in the number of primary care physicians that used uh, telehealth to treat patients growing from 20% to 80%. And the second thing we're seeing is really the acceleration of value-based care. The government continues to push spend into the private markets to incentivize more adoption of, of value-based care contracting. Uh, and one of the ways we see this is in the massive shift to Medicare Advantage. So Christian, I think for some of the audience, a concept like Medicare is not so well known. Could you explain what, what that is? Yeah, sure, uh, Toron. Medicare is the US government's health coverage for over 65 year olds. And Medicare Advantage is the part of Medicare where private companies can acquire members and manage them at their own risk. Um, and the number of Medicare Advantage beneficiaries more than doubled over the last 10 years, and we see it almost doubling again over the next 10 years. So that is one of the reasons why we're really excited about our exposure in value-based care. So uh, we talk a bit about a lot about value-based care and this notion of, of focusing on outcomes rather than than sort of repetitive treatments. But uh, if this is so beneficial, why is not everyone doing value-based care? Yeah, Torun, it sounds intuitive, uh, but it's actually extremely complex to execute. It, it takes capabilities that a typical provider just doesn't have. For example, it takes uh, risk contracting capabilities with insurers uh, or world-class data science capabilities to be able to access and monitor patients from afar. Um, and so in a way, this creates a unique opportunity for new entrants to, to enter this market provide these services uh, and wrap them around these physician networks. Um, and that's really what we're seeing happening in the market right now with pure play value-based care providers expand rapidly, such as uh, Village MD, Oak Street Health, and so on. Okay, so we will shortly be joined by to uh, Toyin and Aya, the founders of CityBlock, uh, and they tried to, they, they were here briefly before. But before we start talking to them, Christian, can you tell me how, how did we meet up with them? How did you find them? Yeah, we, we had invested in Village MD in 2019, uh, which gave us uh, sort of our first exposure in value based care and really in what I touched on before in the Medicare. Uh, Medicare Advantage and commercial markets, and we were looking to expand this exposure into the Medicaid market, which is uh, the program for the underprivileged in the US. Um, and so we found CityBlock and met Aya at one of the largest healthcare conferences in the US a couple of years ago. Um, and we sat down with him and Andy Slavitt, uh, who we were working with. Okay. So, Chris, thanks for joining. Christian, you will be back to join the conversation with Aya and Toyin. But before you leave us, Chris, thanks a lot for all your contributions to Shinevik, and we look forward to keep working with you as a partner at General Catalyst. Thank you, Torin. So, nice. before we start talking to Aya and Toyin, let's have a short look at what does CityBlock do? CityBlock is a leading tech-driven value-based healthcare provider for populations with complex care needs in underserved communities in the US. CityBlock was founded on the premise that health starts at the neighborhood level. So they built a care model that addresses the root causes of health, seamlessly integrating primary care, behavioral health, and social services in a flexible, scalable model. In doing so, they have improved health and lives in communities that have previously been underserved. And they are working with partners that manage billions in medical spend. Today, they are delivering care to thousands of people across the United States. And they're not stopping there. Because what people want is better health, not more health care. We're so excited to have you with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. 
Good. So, having. so the audience just saw saw a short clip about city block toy. And can you explain why are the patients that you care for why are they falling through the cracks in the U.S. healthcare system today? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us here. Um, so our patients are underserved because the healthcare system in the United States and the social safety net aren't equipped to handle the needs of folks whose health needs intersect with poverty. Um, we have a significant population in the United States who struggle with the confluence of poverty, lack of access to social services, systemic underinvestment in their communities, as well as physical health and mental health and substance use challenges, all of which predispose them to worse outcomes and to higher um, acute care utilization. Um, it follows that these patients then fall through the cracks when they hit up against a healthcare system that for all the reasons that Christian sort of laid out and helped to explain um, is really focused on reactive care, whose incentives aren't aligned around improving outcomes typically, um, but instead around dosing out um, uh, elements of, of episodic reactive care when people show up in the acute care setting. And so for our members, being able to wrap around them, um, ensure that people have the time and the trusted relationships that they need to access comprehensive healthcare services in the community before they need to go to the hospital um, has been a longstanding challenge in the healthcare system and majorly contributes to um, rising costs and worsening outcomes over time. These are the folks who we are really built to serve. Thanks, Torian. And uh, could you explain to us what the care model does that's unique in the market to really serve the patients you, you just described? Absolutely. So when you think about the needs of the patients in the communities that we serve, um, these are folks, as I described, who have multiple competing priorities. They're both struggling with social issues and often with mental health and chronic physical health needs. Um, what we know is that a healthcare model like ours needs to be focused on engagement and really driving trust and activation. The data shows um, even before the pandemic that populations with the most complex needs often have the lowest utilization of primary care and mental health services, largely because of the way it's reimbursed, but also because of lack of access. So the first thing that we do is focus on engaging people and building meaningful trusted relationships with individuals and communities so that they're able to access health services often um, uh, coming out of a background of having felt very stigmatized and marginalized from the traditional healthcare system. The next thing that's really important is being able to integrate services. Um, so we know that human beings don't exist as sort of separated organ systems or separated clinical diagnoses. Our brains and our mental health is connected to our physical health, is connected to our environment. And so separating out um, the delivery of healthcare doesn't actually work for people. Um, what we do is we integrate those services. We provide mental health and physical health and social care all in the same place, recognizing that people's needs are holistic and we've got to address them in a holistic way. The other piece that is so critical is um, the ability to meet people where they are. And we talk about this as a, as a core of our model. It's not just physically. So we serve members in our physical hubs located in the communities where they live. We also serve people in their homes um, and have an extensive um, home-based clinical model. We care for people during moments of transition when they're in the hospital and need to be transitioned home. Um, we accompany people to social services within the community. We're there 24 7, 365, virtually and in person. Um, and the, the recognition that our healthcare needs don't follow a nine to five schedule, but that, um, that, that we really must be able to meet people where they are and infuse all of our services with an idea towards scale to technology, allowing us to surface insights um, and drive decision support. So we're fully integrating the needs of the members with where, they, where they're living and working and experiencing their day-to-day -day lives. That is very unique in the market. Um, that heterogeneous approach, that ability to really serve people with mental health and physical and social needs and to show up where they are in an integrated model. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Torian. And I, uh, uh, it sounds like it's a complex population, right? And it, it really requires this high touch, extensive care model that Torian was walking us through. Uh, could you help us explain uh, how you drive margin in a model like that? Sure. Thanks, Christian. So the U.S. healthcare system is deeply wasteful. And as you well articulated at the top, much of that waste stems from the way that we pay for services. On a fee-for-service basis or paying for units of service in Brooklyn, which is where Toyin and I both call home, going to the hospital costs $10,000, $11,000. 
for $11,000, I can pay for food for a family of four for two and a half years. I can pay for 500 hours of community health worker time, 120 primary care visits, 180 behavioral health visits. And the disproportionate way in which dollars are allocated in this system perpetuates the system of high cost and perpetuates a system that of, of inefficient outcomes. So in the way that we are paid, as you described, Christian, as a value-based organization, we're able to invest upstream and keep people first out of hospital. Keeping them out of the inpatient hospital and emergency setting is the most important cost lever that we can pull. And we believe there's between 30 and 40% of wasted spending in the system. And then from there, third-party claims, first-party assessments that we do create very strong data signals in a tech-enabled system that allows us to deploy selectively highest ROI interventions, whether they be for medical, behavioral, or social needs, that allows us to meet acuity level and specific need of individual members in a cost-efficient way. And all of this is built around the premise that we take full accountability for the total spending of a population. And by investing upstream in primary prevention and community services, uh, which in the US is, is notably absent as you and Toyin have both well described, we're able to keep people out of the downstream and much more expensive inefficient settings. Great. And uh, lastly, I, I think the audience would be super interested in hearing your approach to quantify the market opportunity um, and also whether you're focused on Medicaid for the long term or you're, you would expand that population focus as well going forward. Sure. So on the total market opportunity, Christian, it's, it's truly massive. We often joke with our investors that our TAM represents a bigger TAM than the entire rest of their portfolio if they're not healthcare investors. And you know, it is a truly in the US only, depending on how one counts it, 1.2, $1.3 trillion total addressable market of public programs alone, of which managed public programs, as you described, Christian, account for about $700 billion. That is those privately managed dollars of which the vast majority is complex or disproportionately um, high need populations. Beyond that, of course, then you can think of, of comparables in other places. And we get calls frequently from, um, from other countries about whether the sort of portable components of our model are applicable in other developing or developed uh, countries ecosystems where even though the broader social safety net may be richer, the underlying need for, for folks with high needs is, is, uh, is often equally potent. We started with Medicaid both and, and dual eligible populations, both because it's what we know well and it's where our passion is, and because we see significant differentiation and greenfield in the market. And certainly over time, we see massive expansion beyond that. Wow, thank you so much. I mean, this makes me want to be a patient of CityBlock. So thank you so much for joining us, Aya and Toyin. Uh, and great to have you with us. Thank and you for having us. So much, thank you. While CityBlock is the most recent investment in our healthcare portfolio, we will now move on to the veteran, that is Babylon Health, our first investment into healthcare, and one we did in 2016. And we will shortly be joined by Ali Parsa, who is the founder and CEO, and Jorgi will also be back to join the conversation. But first, let's have a look at the operations of, of Babylon Health. Babylon is a digital healthcare service company set to re-engineer a better model of healthcare by providing artificial intelligence and broader technologies with the best human expertise. Their mission is to put an accessible and affordable healthcare service in the hands of every person on earth by leveraging tech. By automating routine tasks, Babylon allows doctors to focus on what they do best, give care to the patients who need it the most. Based in the UK, Babylon currently provides services for millions of members and 170 global partners in several countries across four continents, with a strong emphasis on the US. Hi, Ali. Good to see you. Hi. How are you? I'm excellent. Thank you so much for having me. Good. We're very glad that you're here. Now, uh, of course, we need to talk about the pandemic. We're one year into the pandemic, and I know it's been a uh, transformation also for Babylon. So can you tell us how has that impacted Babylon? 
Um, the, pa the pandemic, I think, has impacted all of us, uh, both personally and professionally. And while it has been very good in growing Babylon, I think that uh, no one should gloat about the about this. I lost my own father to the pandemic last year, uh, my best friend. Uh, so it's 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 a sad thing that is happening to all of us. So, uh, but but the effect for Babylon has been one of immense growth. We have quadrupled our revenue again last year. We had done the same the year before, uh, as you know, and we are hoping to achieve the same this year. Uh, our um, uh, our uh, consumer-based paid members went to 20 million. We saw a patient every five seconds. We delivered 1.3 million clinical consultation, 2 million AI interaction. Uh, we moved into the United States where we now in California alone look after three and a half million uh, 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 Medicaid patients for their telemedicine, not end to end. But we also managed to build a business from scratch on uh, uh, what you earlier described so well by Christian and Toyn and uh, Leah on, um, on value-based care, uh, where we built a business of about 65,000 members now. If you think Christian uh, very rightly described the importance of that sector, but if you think about uh, one of the companies Christian mentioned, Oak Street Health, it took them about 10 years to go from zero to 70,000 members. And we went to 70,000 members in um, a matter of 10 weeks, uh, frankly, from uh, at the end of uh, September, we had none, and now we have about 65,000. So it's been good, we've grown a lot, but it's been, uh, it has taken a huge toll on the world as a whole. So I don't want to be too boastful about uh, what is not uh, a good event for all. Ali, uh, we've been part of this impressive journey for some years now, and, and um, this is only the beginning. But now when you're going in for real into the US market, which is a very competitive market, what is the uniqueness? What makes Babylon different? And what can be different for the American patient? Um, I, I think that I'm not sure whether we will be unique, but I think we have something to offer. And what we have to offer is a platform that was built to scale, to not deal with sick care, as it was described uh, earlier so well, but to focus on keeping people healthy and, and, and they monitor them continuously. And of course, unfortunately, if they do get sick to then uh, look after them intensively to bring them back to health and then keeping, trying to keep them at the height uh, of uh, their health. That model is still a small minority of providers in the US who do so. And again, I was listening uh, to Christian early on, how he described it really well. That it's an incredibly hard thing to do, to uh, monitor people while they're healthy. You must remember that entire sick care system in the United States, and we call it healthcare, it really isn't. It waits for people to get sick and then it fixes them and brings them back. Mm. It's a highly valuable thing to do, but the entire incentive system is based around that sick care. And there are not that many players who are trying to take the budget uh, as uh, City Block is doing, take the budget and then invest it heavily in keeping people healthy. And as Leah described earlier, this is an industry that has huge potential. The TAM is massive. The value-based section in it is tiny. The room for growth is significant. I was talking to a, um, a member of the new administration and a uh, official of the White House the other day. And when you look at how much there is to go on, how much appetite there is for this, I think there is room for everybody to grow. Great to hear, Ali. And I mean, you've expanded the platform from being very product or centralized, uh, powerful AI into move va uh, moving to value-based care and physical care. What's your view of the omnichannel, if you will, of healthcare going forward? Let's say 10 years from now, what will be digitally, what will be physically, you think? I was born in Middle East. And uh, they say, if you want God to laugh in that part of the world, you give <laughs> her your two-year plan. And the reality is none of us can predict where the world will be in 10 years' time. But I think what we will see 
is a much more integrated world. One in which what I wear in my watch, the actions that is monitored on my phone will have a direct effect in the ability of healthcare providers to continuously monitor me, one. Two, to give me a assessment of my health in dynamic continuous basis and predict where I'm going. Three, to continuously adjust my health goals. And four, to give me plans that are personalized to me to meet those health goals. Five, to monitor me uh, uh, seamlessly. And six, to reward me for staying healthy. And that continuum between uh, physical to virtual will be seamless. And you know, I hear a lot of people talking about, look, we have to do things in the physical world. And I believe that too, but the reality is there is nothing that is scalable by building more clinics, by building more hospitals, by creating more beds. Uh, and also when you look at the yogi, that only looks after people in the tiny amount of time through their lives that they go visit a doctor. That is not the, what determines our health mm -hmm. is almost everything else we do. How I speak today is more than anything else related to the mm -hmm. fact that I slept well last night. If I had slept badly last night, as I do often, then what you have would be a much worse performance uh, uh, today than I would have done mm -hmm. otherwise. By the way, speaking of performance, Yogi, I heard your speech, you're a pro. Uh, not only you're a fantastic CEO, you're a great present. Thank you very much, Ali. And I mean, I think you told me once that that this is not about replacing doctors and nurses. It's about making them 10 times more efficient. And that's what you're alluding to, how we can use this data on, a, on an ongoing basis. Very interesting. My final question, Ali, is, is around your capitated model. When you're now bringing that from US into Asia and Europe, what is the main difference here looking at that model? So I think uh, I think uh, uh, if if I go back and think about perhaps uh, one of the biggest mistakes we made in Babylon was not to go to the U.S. fast enough. U.S. is a, a the largest market in healthcare. It's not only forty percent of all the revenue in healthcare. It is probably uh, well north of uh, fifty percent. The majority of the disposable healthcare uh, uh, in the capability in healthcare. I mean, in UK, we have a, say, a $200 billion healthcare market, but the reality is 90% of that is allocated and cannot shift in any shape or form. Uh, so uh, US has a huge advantage, and I am delighted that we are in the US. We will give it all the attention it needs in the next two years um, uh, to catch up with what we should have done maybe a couple of years earlier. Having said that, um, uh, beyond US, I see Asia as the fastest growing market in healthcare. We're lucky to be in 11 Asian countries with our software that allows us to monitor, to watch and see how people behave, uh, to collect the data that we require in order to plan our clinical operations. And I hope that once we get our head around the US and have that organized, uh, we'll move into uh, the Asian market. But I think that uh, as you have often told me, Yogi, CEOs are defined by their ability to focus. And I think in the next two years, our focus will remain United States. Um, while we keep our home that we are very proud of in Europe uh, and in UK and specifically, and where we do continue doing our work in Rwanda, one of the things I didn't mention and I must mention is the fact that last year, brought for us a contract that perhaps I'm most proud of, which is Excellency President Kagame of Rwanda, where we wrote a 10-year contract to deliver free, at the point of delivery, universal primary care to the entire population of the country. We have already registered 20% of that population. We delivered 3,500 consultations at a cost of around $1.5 each every single day mm. in Rwanda. Um, that tells you how scalable healthcare can be. And I think that is the way to go for the rest of the world. That's fantastic, Ali. And I think uh, a lot of exciting things happening going forward. So thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to hosting you again at our next event. Thank you for having me. Thank you very thank much, you, Ali. Ali. Thank you.
And I think we still have Christian on the line. Hi, Christian. Hey, Tora. So uh, we've not heard from CityBlock and Aya and Toyin and Ali. Uh, what are your reflections on what you've heard and what it means for our healthcare portfolio and our focus going forward? Yeah, uh, thanks, Tora. And I think what is evident listening to the three of them is really that despite the scientific advancements in healthcare, there remain very large care gaps. Um, that's uh, something we call health inequity and is effectively an unfair distribution of access and quality of care across the country. Um, and we are very determined to keep backing these missionary companies like Babylon and CityBlock that, uh, that help close these care gaps and make quality care accessible to people no matter where they live or where they come from. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Christian. And that concludes our discussion on the healthcare sector. And we will now move on to talk about the consumer services sector.